following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. Um, yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. All right, if you would, open up your Bibles. Uh, we are in Galatians chapter 1. Uh, you're going to be, if you're in the New Testament, um, it is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you get, uh, those are the Gospels, okay? Acts is the church and how the church kind of formulated. And then uh, you'll get into these things called letters, okay? So you have um, things like First and Second Corinthians, and you have Romans. And then uh, we always say in our house, you go eat popcorn, Okay, so Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. It's just easy uh, to do that, all right? So uh, Galatians is a New Testament letter, and it is uh, absolutely uh, fascinating, and hopefully we'll be able to do it a good service uh, today. In roughly uh, A.D. 49, so 50 years after Jesus has died and rose again and ascended, and he's sitting on the right hand of God, we have this guy, his name is Paul, and his friend named Barnabas. And they arrive back in a place called Antioch. And Antioch, if you are unfamiliar of where that is or, or what that looks like on a modern day map, that is modern day Turkey, okay? They spent 18 months, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 13, going all over building churches, okay? So we have this missionary journey, if you will, where these two men are going, and they're uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're building churches, and they're, uh, they're saying, you need to gather, and you need to be together, and you need to pray together, and you need to sing together, and it needs to always be about Jesus, okay? And so as we kind of get into Galatians, what we realize is 50 years after Jesus um, had, had come and after he had kind of completed his mission, Paul gets this really harsh word uh, from the churches in Galatia, that something was transpiring in this churches that he had set up, and they're falling into hard times via a group of people, and this is going to be important for our study, they're called the Judaizers, and the Judaizers uh, essentially are individuals who are going to influence believers saying uh, that they have to do something in order to get right with God uh, above and beyond accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So they're, they're pushing this works mentality. They're saying you have to work to get to God. And their biggest thing is with these Judaizers is they knew the Old Testament law really, really well. And so they said, we have to still follow this law because of the grace that we have received from God. You have to conform to the Mosaic law. And they believed that all of this was important for salvation. So the doctrine of the Judaizers or the belief of these Judaizers was a mixture of grace through Christ and works by keeping the law. And that's a problem. And as we start to study Galatians, we probably look at that and we go, so what? Like, one, not modern day Turkey. Two, not a Galatian. Okay, whatever that is. Three, uh, I don't understand how this applies to my everyday life. Well, there's many groups today who have the exact same beliefs and practices similar to these New Testament Judaizers. All right? Uh, one big group is the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church doctrine is a mix of law and grace. And there are people outside of even the Roman Catholic Church that say, you have to work in order to obtain your salvation. You have to do something to get to God. As a matter of fact, in 1545, I know that was uh, just a few years ago, but there's this Council of Trent where the Catholic Church realized that there was these uh, Protestant people who were pushing back against the Catholic Church. And as they pushed back to the Catholic Church, uh, what they said is, we need to respond to these Protestant people. And their response was this. They said, we are going to put into words that we explicitly deny the idea of salvation by faith alone. It's penned, and it's still lived out to this day. And so you have this Roman Catholic Church that holds a certain sacraments are necessary for salvation, and they're not alone. There's other groups that hold that your belief that it's just grace alone 
is, is it needs to accompany works. So uh, any group that attempts to merit God's grace through performance of ritualistic acts is heresy. Okay, and we'll stand on that truth because that's what the Word of God says. So this is why Paul's letter is really important because it's, it's kind of aggressive a little bit and he wants believers to understand how great God's grace is in regards to salvation and why living a sinful lifestyle is so dangerous. So if there was a prayer that I had for you as like a pastor and for me as well, it would be twofold. It would be one, that you would understand the grace of God that has been given to you and its full ramifications, but number two, you would realize how dangerous it is to live a sinful lifestyle. We've been freed from sin. Holiness is upon us. And Paul's words in Galatians are very similar to Jesus' words to the invalid in Bethsaida. It's, it's almost the same as the woman who was caught in adultery in John 5. And Jesus says, go and sin no more. And he's not talking about sinless perfection, but more he's warning against returning to old sinful lifestyles and choices. And so knowing this and the gospel that we've been given, uh, it produces in us obedience. And that's the goal here, is to understand the gospel so that we'd be obedient to it. And let's pray for that this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to preach and to teach. And, and you know it, and I know it, that when I come up here and open up your word, uh, we have to take it for what it is and, and realize that it's a gift and approach it with some adoration and, and reverence and awe over the fact that you came and you died and you rose again. So God, is, um, I try as hard as I can to speak to these people uh, as if you would speak to them. I pray that you would fill in the cracks of where I do your word a disservice and you would help us see this, this great, wonderful, glorious gift that we have been given and how we're supposed to live that out in our everyday lives. And I pray, God, that Community Gospel Church would be a lighthouse for the lost and we would continue to help people see what they've been given because of the gift that you gave us. But God, also, that would be so edifying and encouraging and it would be something that frees us. I pray that you would just uh, be clear today in the message that you have for us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, here we go. Go. Galatians uh, chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 1. Paul, who is an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ, the God and Father who raised him from the dead, and all of the brothers who are with me. Pauls. Circle Paul in your text, because some of you guys know him very well. Some of you guys have no idea who that is. Paul is pens one-third of the New Testament text to us. And as he starts to articulate in his letters, most first century letters include him addressing himself. I am Paul. Now, these probably aren't his words. He probably used a scribe, okay? We know that that's true because uh, in Romans chapter 16, he talks about this a little bit, and he usually writes the last few lines in his own hand to authenticate the message. He does this in Galatians uh, chapter 6. Now, three things that we know about Paul and why it's important for us, all right? Number one, we know, uh, first and foremost, Paul is a person, all right? We also know that he was kind of ugly, <laughs> okay? Uh, he was not a very good-looking individual. But Paul, which is his Roman name, is the Latin approximation of Saul, and so he was born Saul. So he has two names. Now, if you grew up in the church, you probably think to yourself, oh, I know, I know Paul, like he's supposed to be called Paul. Well, pause for a second. Yes, he is called Paul, but he's also called Saul, and he uses those names interchangeably, Okay. So there's a lot of times when people think that he just is called Paul after his conversion, and that's not necessarily true. He goes back and forth. He is born in Tarsus around uh, 1 to 5 AD in a providence that is in the corner of modern-day Turkey to a Jewish family from a tribe of Benjamin. Now, Paul, growing up in this, uh, in this family, we would realize that he is the uh, perfect uh, Christian kid, okay? He goes to Awana. He's got full vest. <laughs> All right? He's good. 
He goes to Club E. He comes to church. He takes notes. When you ask Paul at the dinner table, what did you learn in church? He gives a full explanation and a full exegesis of what happened in church. His parents are so proud of him, right? Okay, so he is raised, though, to be a very strict Pharisee, and he welcomes this. It's as almost as if his parents looked at him and said, you are going to inherit the family business, man. You're going to go so far. And Paul says, absolutely, 100%, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with excellence, okay? And so as we realize here, he, uh, his parents realize that their shortcomings, and so they get him a teacher in Acts chapter 22, and this teacher is a very well-known uh, pharmaceutical teacher, and he starts to instruct Paul. And so Paul, uh, who is also Saul, is raised as a Roman citizen, and he uses that to his advantage in Acts 22. But what's interesting is he meets Jesus, okay, on the road to Damascus, and he has a radical life change, and he goes from the biggest persecutor of the church that we know of today to the person who populates it and pushes people to come into the church. And so Paul has this radical transformation in regards to coming to Jesus Christ. He comes into, uh, uh, into the church, and, and we see something happen here. Now, I want you to get something about Paul, okay? You have to learn something, and I have to learn something from Paul, the person. And that's this. Number one, anyone can get saved. Grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, the coworker that you have that drives you crazy, anybody can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we learn anything from Paul, he is the one who shows us very clearly what it means to come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every person matters to God. From average Joes to wicked degenerates, anyone, anyone, anyone can get saved. So the people who attack you, the people who drive you crazy, we have to turn our attitudes and start to pray for those people and realize that those are the Saul's and the Paul's in our life that desperately need the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we learn anything from Paul, it's that anyone can get saved. Number two, we learn that anyone can become a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. Paul is not afraid to tell other people about what Jesus did for him. He boldly declares the excellencies of him who called him out of darkness into glorious light. See, we understand salvation, but we forget that we're supposed to be a powerful witness. Number three, we learn that anyone can live missionally. A salvation from God, moving into a powerful witness to live missionally, fully surrendering his life. Paul pens in Philippians chapter one, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So let's just pause for a second, okay, and see yourself in the text. Number one, do you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ? Has Christ shown you that you are a sinner and in desperate need of a Savior? Number two, do you realize that you can be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ in your workplace, in your home? Do you realize that God has called and commanded you on point to live missionally for Him? Well, Pastor Jordan, I work at a factory. Okay, God can use you in that factory. Pastor Jordan, I work... Uh, I don't work. <laughs> I'm at home, right? Well, God can use you in the home. God can use you in your everyday relationships, and we have to be able to articulate like Paul did for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, so Paul, the person, comes to Jesus Christ, biggest persecutor of the church, moving into one who populates it. Number two, calls himself an apostle. Circle that word apostle. Paul is not one of the original 12 disciples who were called apostles. He is one who is sent out on a mission from Jesus Christ. So Paul's walking on the road to Damascus. Jesus meets him personally. He says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He can't give him a clear answer. And because he can't give him a clear answer, he says, if you're going to be the one who persecutes me, then I want you to see me for who I really truly am. So boom, Paul comes. He says, you know what? Okay, I confess that you are the Messiah. I see it now. I see it so clearly. And all of a sudden, Jesus looks at him. He strikes him blind for three days. And now he looks at him and he says, I want you to go and share the gospel with those who need it the most, the Jew first and then the Gentile. And so Jesus sent Paul as an apostle on a mission. So he is an apostle, not like the original 12, but he is one of them. So Jesus calls Paul on the road to Damascus, and we see that he says, it is not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and the God, the Father who raised him from the dead. So the apostles are messengers under direct authority of Christ, 
setting up and supervising churches, discipline and correcting when necessary. Why does Paul do this? He is presenting his credentials as an apostle because his authority is going to be undermined in Galatian churches. Now, we see something about Paul here as well. He is not prideful in his relationship with God. As a matter of fact, he's the opposite. He is very humble. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, To me also, as to one who is abnormally born, that means I had a weird childhood, okay? I am the least of the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. Now, I always joke with college students, and I say, uh, this doesn't make Paul Popeye. I am who I am, right? Any of you who grew up with that. But what we see here is what Paul is saying. He says, if believers in Galatia are going to question his apostleship, then they should question the apostleship of Peter. They should question the apostleship of John. And they should question the apostleship of James. All the apostles are called by God and answered to him as final authority and held each other accountable. So what's so amazing about this? Paul is giving us information not to point to himself, but he's pointing to Jesus Christ, and so we should as well. We should understand the gospel of Jesus Christ points to Jesus and not to self. And while we're not called apostles per se, all followers of Christ are called to be his ambassadors, Matthew 28, and we're all ones who are sent out on a mission to proclaim the good news and edify other believers. So do we? Do we do that? Do you do a good job of that? All right. So he is a person, he is an apostle, and let's see the third thing, he is a brother. He says brother here was his fellow worker who joined him in sending greetings to the Galatian believers. So Barnabas, Titus, and Timothy are all going to be there, all brothers or members of God's family, but my question is why bring them up? Why mention these guys? Well, this adds force a little bit uh, to what he's uh, about to say because he's going to correct them. So he's got some really harsh or stern words to say. John Stott says this. I think it's really interesting. He was an English theologian. In 2005, Time Magazine called this evangelical one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And what we realize is, uh, John says, the authority by which the Christian leader leads is not by power, uh, but it's by love. It's not by force. It's by example. It's by reasoned persuasion. Leaders, which we all are, have the ability to have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. So my opportunity and my obligation is to humble myself, to serve Jesus Christ, to see my life needs to be lived out missionally wherever God has located me for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? See, here's what happens and transpires. It's happening and transpiring right now. That message is boring. It's boring because you've heard it a thousand times. And we've heard it a thousand times, so we're like little children who need to be told over and over and over again. And God says, open up your mouth and start declaring him who calls you out of darkness into glorious light so that you could see how much joy that you really would truly have. I was uh, with uh, uh, some dear brothers this past week at the Evangelical Free Church uh, Theology Conference. And we were gathering, and uh, as we gathered, we, we were hearing some message from some really guys who were just top-notch. And one of the guys said, he said, the reason why the world is the way it is right now is because believers have failed to be consistent in modeling the small things for Jesus Christ and doing them with excellence. So essentially what he says is, he's like, God is not going to entrust for us believers the big things unless we are faithful with the small things. And the small things are the mundane things. They're the boring things. And so Paul, who is a mastermind in the Old Testament, who understands this stuff so clearly, he looks at it and he says, listen, I'm first of all a person who was saved by the grace of God, became a powerful witness for God, living on mission for God. And what happened to me was I started realizing how much God was working in my life when I stopped making life all about me and connected with other believers in the church and started proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who needed it the most. Because the gospel's not just... For somebody who is lost, it's also for you. It's validation over what you have received. So this is Paul's message. This is the apostles' message. And their message has to become our message because Galatians was written just as much to us as it was for the Galatian church. So this is how we make Jesus Christ known near and far. Now watch, okay? There's something interesting happens and transpires. Go to the second part of verse 2. So to the churches 
of Galatia, grace and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God the Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's look at the audience, which is Galatia, which is you and me. Galatians is an example. Paul's writing to a region, okay, kind of like Ephesians. And each of the other letters are addressed to an individual church like Philippians or a person like Titus. But this region and intent is interesting because it's how it was supposed to be distributed. Let's talk about Galatia for a second. Galatia is a Roman providence located in the center section of present-day Turkey. And much of the region, people are coming to populate that region because of the fertile fields. So agriculture is a must here, okay? And as they come and they're moving there, we're realizing during the missionary journeys, Paul visited these regions with large populations in order to reach as many people as possible. So he would put himself where people were at so that he could make Christ known, but also at the same time plant churches. Now, the interesting thing is Galatians was meant to be circulated. And as Galatians was circulated from church to church and person to person, Paul specifically told the people that what he wanted them to do was he wanted to read the letter out loud to the congregational gathering and then give it to people who were in their everyday life. Now, here's what's crazy to me, okay? This, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. Why, as believers, are we so adamant to give people everything else except the gospel of Jesus Christ? It cracks me up. Hey, have you checked out this Bible study? Have you watched this speaker, right? It cracks me up. How come we just don't look at somebody and be like, have you ever read the book of Galatians? It's really fascinating. Do you know how many people came to know Jesus Christ by reading the book of Romans? It's amazing to me. We give people everything else except the Bible because it's awkward. So not only, not only, okay, do we have problems here in regards to opening our mouth, but we have problems with pointing people to the word of God. Because not only is Jesus like our awkward friend, right? His word is kind of that awkward book. But if we sit down with somebody and we're like, hey, could you read this for me? Could you study this text? That's exactly what Paul's saying. I want you to sit down. And I want you to read the word of God together. It's not a suggestion. It's a command that Jesus sets out for us in Matthew 28, Mark 16, to be a catalyst for eternal heart change in our neighborhood and throughout the world. We often think that the Bible is for other people, but it's not for us. And so this, this letter is for you, and there's, there's merit to reading it, okay? Now, watch. He says, here's the intent, okay? Here's the intent. The intent is grace and peace. Grace is the word charis. It reminds readers of God's kindness, that God was so kind to us when he offered salvation to us on the cross, an unbelievable gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And Paul says to obtain God's grace requires faith. So before he even starts to unpack the letter, he talks about God's grace to a church who desperately needed to understand the gift that they've been given. So he looks at him and he says, listen, I want to talk to you about grace and how, how God has worked. Ephesians chapter 2 says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're all guilty under the moral and legal law. The Old Testament law was given to the people so that they could see how much they fell short of the glory of God. Not so that they could try to live it out. And so what happens here is we see this undeserved favor via Christ's work on the cross. And what we know to be true is we don't discover God's grace. It relentlessly pursues us. That God's grace relentlessly, constantly, passionately, and purposely pursues our life. And Paul says, listen, I want you guys to understand that grace has been pursuing us since Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so Paul says, we have to know God's grace because God's grace leads to God's peace. The Greek here, the word peace, reminds us of Christ's offering of peace to the disciples as we lived out our faith in the evil world. Now, now pause for a second. Track with me here, okay? The reason you don't have peace in your everyday life is because you don't understand grace. So last year in 2020, and this year, as 2020 said goodbye, and we moved into 2021, there are so many people, believers included, who are at a state of unrest because, number one, they haven't accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Number two, they haven't lived out the grace of Jesus Christ in their everyday life, which produces peace. So here's my push to the church. And if you're listening online, I'm just, I'm dropping the hammer today. I understand that. But, but here's the thing. If you don't have the peace of God in your life, then maybe you never made a declaration to come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Like, I understand this because I grew up in the church. 
Like I spent a lot of time in the pews listening to my dad preach. And what I learned was when I got to college, I, didn't, I, I knew the grace of God in my head and what the grace of God was, but I never let it trickle down from my head to my heart and it became faith. So that's the problem for us. We, we, we wrestle with unrest because we haven't gotten peace because we have not understood grace. And so what Paul is saying here is he says, grace summarizes God's gift to us, but peace recaps personal results of that gift. So, so it's like this, peace is felt grace and the quiet confidence that we have in being joyful in our unlimited possibilities in Christ. So how does that play out to your everyday life? It plays out like this. You know the sin that you struggle with that you just can't get rid of and you just can't let go? You struggle with that. You can't let go of that because you have not accepted full grace, confidence, understanding the fact that God is able to do far more abundantly than you could ever ask and imagine, but that takes faith. So I have to trust that where I fall short, God picks up and he moves on, carrying me the whole way. That's the quiet confidence that we have in God's grace. It's the joy in the unlimited possibilities in, in Christ. <laughs> I was thinking about this in my everyday life. And uh, last week I had, a, I had a problem that popped up. I told Bethany, I called her up and she's like, you okay? And I was like, yeah, my stomach hurts. She's like, why? I said, I think I got an ulcer. And she's like, we're going to the doctor. I said, magically, I feel better. <laughs> and what I realized was, man, I was, I was just struggling about something. Like I was overthinking it. You ever do that? Anybody ever overthink that stuff? You know? And, and I got to the point where I just stopped and I was like, wait, hold on a second. God, increase my faith and give me peace to know that what I'm about to participate in is possible because of what you did on the cross. Whoa. Everything changed. So now I don't want to run into my room, right? I want to run into the realm and see God work and do his magic. And so Paul's saying, listen, you guys in the Galatian church are falling susceptible to these Judaizers because you haven't understood the concept of grace and allowed peace to resonate in every area of your life. The great Martin Luther said this, grace releases our sin. What? And peace makes the conscience quiet. Just perhaps, maybe, just maybe, I'm thinking out loud here. Maybe we're so indoctrinated with the noise of the world that we can't see the grace of God clearly or feel his peace and presence in our life. The two themes that torment us are sin and conscience. I am most restless when I am most convicted. And I am most convicted when my eyes are saturated with the sins of the world. But Christ has vanquished all of these, these two monsters, and trodden them underfoot, both in this world and in the world to come. The Bible tells us so clearly we're more than conquerors in Christ, but we don't believe it. Why don't we believe it? Because we don't understand the grace that we have been given. Paul's saying, you put the cart in front of the horse, guys. You're trying to work for this grace. You can't work for this grace. You're trying to work for this peace. You can't work for this peace. You have to have the quiet confidence that comes from the gift that you have received. If somebody gave you a great gift, you rest in that gift. You don't look at them and say, hey, I, I, I'll pay you back, right? I mean, how many of us at Christmas did that, right? Somebody gave us a great gift and we're like, just give me like a year and I'll make it up to you. It doesn't work that way. Can you imagine how restless you would be trying to do that? Now look at verse 3 and 4. Paul declares to the church that true grace and peace come only from the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself up for our sins. And he makes it personal. Don't miss that. You could circle our, which he adds to Father our, emphasizing the authority and identifies Jesus as Lord. He says, you're banking your faith and trust off of what other people are saying. You're listening to the noise of this world. You've got you to turn around and understand that God has personally spoken to you via Jesus on the cross to give you a confidence that the world cannot even fathom. Right? Like, that's amazing. It's the most personal moment we get here in the New Testament where Paul's saying, if Jesus died on the cross for me, he also died on the cross for you. And if he was in it for himself, he would say, hey, I want you to worship me. But he's like, no, I want you to worship Jesus, our Lord, a title given after his resurrection and ascension that rivals him and reveals him as worthy of worship. 
So Paul wastes no time getting to the point. He says, listen, if you accept any other gospel than this, it is a sin. If somebody were looking to you and say, you've got to work for your salvation, I'd be like, man, that, that just seems so burdensome, right? I'd be like me looking at my kids saying, hey, next year for Christmas, you're going to work for those presents. They'd be like, dad, we can't do enough. I'd be like, no kidding, right? That's what Paul's saying to the church here. And, and from Galatia to community gospel, we look at verse four and five, and we study this letter written to us because it is written to us. And, and look what it says right at the end. Galatians is a rescue from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at that very first part. It is a rescue from the present evil age. Oh my word. Do we need rescued from the present evil age? Man, pull me out of this mess. And Paul's saying you're in the mess, but you're going to be rescued from the mess even though you're present in the mess. What? What? Now, that Greek word rescue can be translated delivered. So Christ not only gave himself up for our sins, but he delivers us from our helpless condition to save us from the trials and the tribulations of the world. And Paul wanted the church and us included to remember that Christ and in Christ we can resist sin in this present evil age. So you're telling me I have a purpose to push back to the evil age? What's my purpose? To evangelize and edify the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the one thing missing from our churches in America? The gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the one thing missing from our homes and our lives? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Can it be so simple? Absolutely. 100%. So four takeaways from five verses, okay? You're like, man, we only did five verses? That's how I roll, okay? You're just going to have to get used to it. <clears throat> Number one. Can we do this as a church too? Like, can you, can you walk with me? Because I've been walking with this all week long. Number one. Can we acknowledge first and foremost that we live in a evil age? Hey, Amen? Yeah, absolutely, right? Happened this morning in the car before I got to church. <laughs> yeah, I get that. All right, yeah, we got to acknowledge it. I get it. I understand it. All right, number two, we have to admit that without Christ, we're trapped. Now, you're good at saying number one, but we're not good at number two. We're really, really good at number one. Yeah, the world's crazy, right? But that's a problem because... If I say that, that I'm trapped without Jesus Christ, what does that do? That identifies that the problem is me. So I take personal ownership that I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Without Christ, I'm trapped. We're trapped. You're trapped. Next time somebody looks at you, maybe it's tomorrow at work or wherever you're at, and they look at you and say, man, the world's messed up, right? That's the word out of your mouth. So let's admit together that without Christ, we're trapped. Wait, we say what? So let's look at the third thing. So now I can make a declaration that without Christ, I'm trapped, but now I have to confess my participation with sin. Whoa. Paul wants the Galatian church to first and foremost identify that they're the cause of what has transpired in their world. Okay, that makes me uncomfortable. Why do bad things happen to good people? Number one, there's no good people. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? Why do good things, or to, why do bad things happen to bad people? Because we're all underneath this thing called sin, and we deserve the judgment of God. So right there, I have to confess my participation in sin. Yep, God, 100%. This is because... We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And number two is important. I am unable to rescue myself. And if Paul were here, he would say the same thing that he was preaching and proclaiming to the Galatians. And that is, stop working for your salvation. Because here's what happens. We acknowledge the world is evil. We acknowledge that we're sinners. And we're saying, okay, God, well, then I'll just work for it. I'll be a better husband. I'll be a better father. I'll be a better worker. I'll be a better churchgoer, right? And we think that all of those things are going to add up to the grace of God, and it's going to make us right in his eyes, but that's not the way it works. Paul says, no, you are unable to rescue yourself. You need something else, and so now that has to, that admittance and that confession starts to seep down, and here's the big thing for us to take away today as we look at these five verses. That God is genuinely concerned about us, that God genuinely cares about us, and that he provides for us through faith in Christ. Whoa. 
If the Apostle Paul, who was the biggest persecutor of the church, can be saved and come to a relationship with Jesus Christ and look at us and say, God is genuinely concerned about you as a loving father. We need to wrap our minds around that. Those of you who struggle with pornography, those of you who struggle with habitual sins, those of you who lie, those of you who gossip, those of you who cheat on your significant other, those of you who swear, we could run the list of sins down, right? How many times do we look at it and, and look at ourselves in the mirror and say, God is genuinely concerned about the sin that just transpired in my life. I thought about this the other day. I got ready. I looked in the mirror, and I heard it in the back of my mind. God said, Jordan, I'm genuinely concerned about you. Okay. So what are you going to do? Because oftentimes when I feel like God is genuinely concerned about me, and maybe this is just my past, I feel like, I feel like the hammer of condemnation is going to come down. Right? Right? But he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to care for you and I'm going to provide for you in ways that you need. Not what you want, but what you need. But you have to, you have to trust me. This is going to hurt a little bit, right? Do we understand that God genuinely cares and loves us and provides for us? It's hard for me to sit with people who, who pray sometimes. Because <laughs> they pray prayers and I look at them and I'm like, man, I don't know if you know what you're praying for. And we, we prayed those three prayers. God, help me to see that you are genuinely concerned about me, that you care for me, and that you'll provide through me. Provide for me, but give me faith. Man, that's tough. Paul's Greco-Roman world, littered with deceit, murder, perversion, military oppression. Satan acts in every single age. We see that tragedy of sin, and we know God wants to rescue but we do we allow them. The early believers committed themselves to the mission to carry out the gospel to themselves and to others. The question on the table is, do we? And so the Bible makes it clear. Any attempt to add to human works to God's grace overlooks the very meaning of grace, which is undeserved blessing. I'll give you two verses and then I'm out your way and we're going to take communion together. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verse 6. If by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were... Grace would no longer be grace. Do you know the gospel of Jesus Christ and by it, know it, do you trust it? There'll come a day when we're going to see our Savior face to face and he's going to ask us two questions. Number one, he's going to say, why should I let you in? I'm going to look at him and say, because I'm real good looking. He's going to say, nope, it doesn't work. Why should I let you in? There's no other answer he's going to accept is every day I woke up and I believed with all of my heart that your grace was greater than anything that was going to come up in my day. And I believe that your grace covers a multitude of my sins, if not, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, all my sins. And I, I banked on that every single day, that your grace covers my sins. And the second question he's going to ask you is, okay, then what'd you do with Jesus? And that moves us to Galatians chapter five. If Christ has set you free, then you're called to stand firm and don't let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. Hmm. So do you see yourself as condemned underneath the eyes of God, or do you see yourself saved by the grace of God, which spurs us on to live a sinless life? That's worship. That's worship. I worship because I've been freed from the yoke of slavery, standing firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Okay, so that's the first five verses, so we got some work to do. Uh, let me pray for you. God, I'm reminded of um, the old hymn. Many of us sang it when we were kids. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace is greater than all of my sin. <laughs> God, um, I don't know why the sermon always comes out different on Sunday than it does in the week. But I know you said what needs to be said. I think sometimes, God, we just need to be still. Because the noise of the world is just is so great.
God, we're all Paul, right? We persecute your church. There's people out there that have a bad taste of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ because we've done you a disservice. I've done it. And we individually and corporately come and ask for your forgiveness. The ways that we've marred the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glorious grace that we have received. And God, as we, we come before you and we start this study of Galatians and we see Paul's life and him being this big persecutor of the church and, and now one who promotes, my prayer today is the same prayer that I've prayed to you all week long, that people would see who they are when they come into a relationship with you. That we stop working for our salvation and realize if we just, if we just understood how, how great the gift is, life would radically change. God, I want to see the gift for what it is. There's nothing I can do to, to get in your good graces. There's no work that I could do to receive salvation. You just gave it up so freely, this definition of love on the cross. God, it makes us uncomfortable because we're not in control. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's, it's simple. You admit you're a sinner and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible tells us so clearly you'll be saved. But God, so many of us have done that. We've, we've trusted Christ and he, he's not working. Why doesn't he work? Because we don't have enough faith. So Community Gospel Church, we come on our knees to the creator of the universe and we ask for your help to stop working for grace. And you would come and, and restore in us the joy of our salvation and that you would help us to believe and trust that you're working for the go good of those who love you and that you're going to work out those situations. You're going to work out those circumstances. You're going to work out those problems. You're going to work. But we have to, we have to believe and we have to trust in faith. And may the peace, God, come pouring into our lives. And the quietness of the sanctuary as we put our faith and our trust in you for every single day. Hmm. That, that peace would just resonate. Help us to put away the world and start really unpacking what the word says. <laughs> Amen. All right. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.